So I started my spoon feeding plan on my yard yesterday. This back here is the test plot where we're running the higher bricks and of course we got a higher height of cut so the stripes are showing up a little bit better. And it is absolutely glowing like a new penny. Man, neighbor's yard is looking pretty good. Everything's pretty much in full blown springtime mode. Man, it's thick. And then we've got this crap back here. I think my housekeeping needs to be a little bit better. Hey there, it's Pete with GCI Turf. I hope you're having a great day today. I want to welcome you to my home. And first and foremost, I want to tell you Happy Easter. Now look, if you want to, stick around till the end of the video. I got something personal I want to share with you. But we're going to do the yard stuff first, so that way when we get to that part, you want to hear it, you can check out. It's an ugly yard fix, right? I think if you've been watching my videos for any length of time and you see the flyovers and all that kind of thing, uh, there's not too much ugly yard going on around here. But what I did do was I have totally and completely 100% neglected my Kentucky bluegrass back here. I started that neglect last fall and I did it because I wanted to make a ugly yard video. This video is directed at the person who's coming in here and looking where to get started. What's my first step? What's the first thing I do? How do I do it? If you guys are on my cool season guide, this isn't for you. Okay, understand that. This video is not directed. It's not something extra you do in the guide. You follow the guide. And speaking of the guide, it is absolutely awesome to be able to go in the, the Facebook group or get these emails I get and there's hundreds of yards before and after pictures, people sending me uh, videos and people sending me pictures of hey look at what the cool season guy did for my yard, it has totally completely changed it, check it out and man I'm eating it up, I absolutely love it that this simple little guide tells you what to do, when to do, how much to do, everything you need to know. And then you use it on your yard and then you guys get to reward me when you send me those pictures. And I'm like, dang, that is so freaking awesome. I absolutely love that. So keep up the good work. This application is for that ugly yard that's loaded with weeds and got lots of good grass in it and you just don't know where to start, you want to get all your weeds cleaned up, feed the turf, prevent things down the future, and, and, and just get, get things rolling, get the ball rolling, right? So, new guys, new gals, here's what we're doing. Okay, you have two, two different main sources of fertilizer. Uh, one will be a granular. Those you put in a spreader, spread it out over your yard. The other way you can feed your yard is with a liquid. A liquid, for a lot of people spook and get wigged out, Ugh, liquid nitrogen, I'm telling you, nothing to it. I'm, I'm telling you, it's nothing to it. So typically on a jug or on a bag of fertilizer, you'll see three little numbers. That's NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. That first number is equals green and grow, okay? Now, you have to be limited. This is why these guides are important because it tells you how much to do at different times during the year because can you over fertilize at certain times in the year? Absolutely you can. So my food source today is going to be Green Punch 1801. 18% nitrogen, it's kind of high in nitrogen but not too high to where the DIY would have potential in burning or anything like that. And obviously if you stand over top of the grass and just soak it down uh, at the wrong time of the year or whatever, obviously you might do a little damage, but that's why the guide is so important. It keeps you from doing all that. That's also why videos like this are so important because it keeps you from doing things like that, okay? I know some folks kind of like, uh, more is better and more is not always better. 
when it comes to grass. All right, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna clean up the weeds that are in the bluegrass and we're going to prevent weeds at the exact same time. Now my choice for a post-emergent, okay, post meaning once you see the weed come up and you can look at the weed, whoo, there's some clover in the yard. I can see it. You need a post-emergent, meaning it has post-germinated and come up and you can visually see it. Now when it comes to that, boy, you got just millions of options. I mean, there is all kind of options, all kind of post-emergent herbicides out there. Now, one of my favorite for a broad spectrum, meaning it covers a whole lot of different weeds, is triplet. It's your standard three-way herbicide. You might hear it labeled as vessel, trimec, triplet, three-way. There's all different labels that go on that, but in the actual jug, is the same active ingredients. And this one just so happens to be named triplet. We're gonna go out here and look at this yard right quick before we spray it. But I've got a little bit of that moss trying to creep back in. It's not much, it's just a little bit. So while I'm at it, while I'm spraying over the entire yard, I'm blanket spraying, meaning I'm spraying the entire area. I'm gonna throw some quicksilver in too. Remember last year how that quicksilver, it just zapped that moss, okay? Unfortunately, a little bit's come back. I'm okay with that because I got some more quicksilver, right? Now, something else I got in the tank is something I'm going to use to kind of balance all of this out, okay? Something new. Uh, you're going to hear me talking about it a lot throughout the summer, but it, it's just more of another test run uh, for me. I use some, I've been using, actually been using quite a bit at the shop, and it is making the shop yard glow like a new penny. Um, but we'll talk about that later and then last but not least definitely not least I wrap all this together tie all of it up with a super high powered adjuvant you might hear it called an adjuvant surfactant sticker spreader uh, I don't know I don't know what else people call it. but at the end of the day an adjuvant is gonna kind of bind this together help this number one to stick to the plant it's gonna help it adhere to the plant so that uh, that chemical or that fertilizer or whatever's in this tank will work much better and more effective because it's stuck to the grass blade or stuck to the weed blade. Now, one thing I don't mix this uh, natural adjuvant with is Humic 12, Aerate, and Dethatch. I don't do that because the recommendations from the manufacturer says, hey, don't drop the pH on those three products specifically. So what's dropping the pH got to do with anything? Well, uh, in order for the adjuvant to be activated, meaning you put the key in the truck and turn the truck on and you start the truck. The way you crank up the adjuvant or activate it is you have to drop the pH to a five or a little bit below. Super simple to do. I get all my product mixed in the tank. I take my pH meter, check my pH of my finished solution meaning everything that's in the tank together, finished solution. If I come in a little bit above a five, I just use a little bit of citric acid. That's all. Just a little, I'm talking about just a little bit. So once I get my pH adjusted, then obviously I'll put my adjuvant in. Now, how do I mix? Mix is so simple, so easy. So many people make it so hard and it's not. So in this particular case, I've got 1,500 square feet of turf. When I get done and have all my products in here, I want two gallons of finished solution. As you can see, I'm right at the two gallon mark. Now inside this two gallons, I have the recommended rate for that. I have the recommended rate for that per thousand square feet. Uh, rate for this and rate for this. So if I end up finished with uh, two gallons, I started with a gallon of water. I pick, always put your dry stuff in first. Listen. See, that's like a dry, powdery type stuff, like a little granular that when you put it in the water, it melts down and dissolves. Always put that stuff in first with water. So I like to do my herbicides next, my post-emergent herbicides, get them in. The entire time I'm putting this stuff in, I'm giving it a little stir. Agitation is key. I want it mixed and evenly distributed out throughout the entire spray tank. Weighing out this dry stuff is super easy. It ain't nothing but a little kitchen scale. 
And of course, I measured it all out with my GCI measuring cup. That way everything's nice and accurate. Now, obviously, if you're gonna spray, you need a sprayer, right? This is the sprayer I like. It's the Strom that we have on the website. Now, I'm gonna be using my trim tip out here today simply because it's just not a real big area. So I have the option of a trim tip or a wide fan tip, which sprays about eight foot wide. And you cover a lot of ground efficiently and accurately. But in this situation, I really don't need that today, so I'm gonna use a trim tip out here. Of course, if you decide you want one of these, that combo that comes with the nozzle, you get a trim tip, you get a wide spray tip, you get a sprayer, and you get an email with another video that'll teach you how specifically to calibrate your sprayer, use it, and there's a PDF guide in there too if you prefer to read. Yeah, this right here is the Blue Heat, uh, GCI Turf Blue Heat. You can see when we get down here on it close, She's looking real good. And again, has had zero food since last fall. Here's the midnight. Of course, we didn't kill this section off, so this grass is two years old, much more mature than this grass. This grass is uh, less than six months old. Let's see, September, October, November, January, February, March, April, seven months old. This turf right here is seven months old, so uh, with zero work done to it, so it really ain't kicked in gear yet. Now I got all kinds of broad leaf weeds. Broad leaf. Look here, they're just there everywhere. Look at that boy right there. Now there is a difference between a broad leaf, ooh, there is a difference between a broadleaf and a grassy type weed. The reason that is important, you can't take a broadleaf herbicide and spray a grassy type weed and expect it to work. It chemically can't do it. If I want that gone, what are my options? Well, I don't really have any options at my house right now other than I've got a shovel. So I'm gonna come out here and dig these up. Here's somebody's favorite friend right here, some Poa annua. The way I am gonna remove this is simply get in here with my hand and dig it up, pull it out, and that way it's gone. Now, one of the cool things about Kentucky Blue is it has a spreading type habit. See these little bit of thin areas right here and right here? In about one month from now, this entire area of turf is going to look remarkably similar to this. Not to mention, this is going to look better as well. So, what if you're a fan of granular fertilizer and you'd much rather do a granular fertilizer just because you absolutely love it? Well, that's completely okay. The process goes from a one-step application to a two-step application, okay? And in that case, spread your fertilizer first. Go ahead and get your fertilizer out. Then you can take that part out, the green punch, and mix everything else up together and go spray. Now, what do you do once you do this? Well, you pick up on a good lawn care program, whether it's your own lawn care program, whether you get it somewhere online, whether you get it straight from me off the website, whether you call your local whoever, uh, and get a lawn care program, doesn't matter. As long as it's a very good, strong, ongoing, repetitious lawn care program uh, that'll help you control weeds, feed your turf, feed the soil, all those kind of things wrapped up into one, th then you just follow it. I mean, it's pretty plain and easy, simple. You follow it. See that nice glossy shine right there? I know that that adjuvant has really helped those products to stick to that leaf blade. So instructions once you spray, keep the kids off of it, keep the dogs off of it, you stay off of it, keep everybody off of the yard, 
give it plenty of time to dry, which is typically one or two hours. It's, that's more than enough time. Just don't do anything to the yard as far as mowing or anything like that for about 48 hours. Now, what about watering? Well, I watered before. I watered yesterday really good. I want the ground moist so that those herbicides and fertilizers can work a little bit better. You know, dry ground and dry uh, plants, herbicides and fertilizers tend to not work as good. So I gave it a really good watering yesterday. And I'm gonna wait about 24 hours before I water again. Now what about the pre-emergent peat? I've always heard you water that in right away. Well, it's completely okay not to. Okay, as long as you get it watered in within the next two or three days, it's going to be completely fine. I've been doing it that way for years and I've had zero issues. Now talking about watering, one thing you don't want to happen is apply this post-emergent herbicide and then immediately it starts raining. Okay, time it around the weather. You want a good sunny day? Look at that big ball of goodness. Woo, I love it. You want a good sunny day with no chance of rain for at least 24 hours, get down your herbicide, your post-emergent herbicide, and you're good to go. Don't you just love that sound? I got a mower and a trimmer going over here. I got a guy mowing over here. I love it when people are outside in the yard. Get outside in the yard, get some work done, help you take your mind off things that are going on. So hey, thank you for watching. I appreciate you taking your time out of your day. I know there's a lot of other things you could be doing, but you're watching some clown talk about grass and how to make it pretty. Again, like I said, I'll link all this stuff up in the description. You can check it out if you want. So hey, be sure and subscribe to the channel and all that kind of cool things. We got a lot of really cool things getting ready to happen in the yard. It's getting ready to heat up a little bit. Getting ready to start talking a little bit about heat stress and that kind of thing how to water and mowing and it's just all kind of cool things going on and, and you know i love stripes in the yard so we won't still have several striping videos going through uh this summer including one with a really big humongous mower deck i mean massive and we're going to stripe up the neighbor's yard with it so you don't want to miss that now i made this application today in about 48 hours couple of days i'm gonna come out here and mow it with the cutest little mower you ever did see i'm telling you it's a little residential battery powered mower it's incredible i'm gonna show you how i'm gonna mow this and clean this yard up then we're gonna put a thatch rake on the same mower uh not a separate thing it, it goes in the mower itself so the mower becomes a dethatcher as well and we're gonna rake this up a little bit so you don't want to miss that i'm gonna show you all that again thank you for watching i appreciate it and look i want to share something with you personal right here and if you don't want to hear it thank you for watching i'll check you later but if you do here we go now i'm telling you a lot of people are scared and confused and they got questions right why is all this happening? Why are we having to deal with this virus why are so many people dying why are people losing their lives the answer is really, really simple. It's a three little word called sin. When God created this world, He created it perfect. When, when He created Adam and Eve and was in the perfect garden that He created, said, hey, this is all yours. You can have it all, do what you want to with it, but you can't touch that tree over there. God gave His first commandment, said, do not eat of that tree. Of course, you all know the story. They were deceived by the evil one and they ate of that tree, right? And what did that do? That caused sin to come into the world and contaminate the human bloodline. I was born with it. You was born with it. There ain't a dang thing you can do to get rid of it except for one thing. The Bible says that for God so loved the world, God loves this world. He loved it and he still does. That he gave his one and only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will have eternal life and won't perish. See, the consequence or the penalty. See, people don't like that word. People don't like it when you say, hey, you have a consequence for your action. It just tears people up. It tears my kids up. 
I mean, and I was like that when I was little. When my dad said, hey, if you do that, if you disobey and you do this wrong, there's a consequence, meaning you get in trouble for doing something wrong. When we disobey God, there is a consequence. The Bible says the wages of sin, the consequence for sin is death. Why do you think people die? Answer me that. Why do people die and they don't live forever? It's because God said the consequence for the sin of the world is to die. Now you can, you can wrap that up into coronavirus, murder, uh, alcoholism, uh, drug abuse, riding down the road on a Sunday afternoon and get run over by a trans transfer truck, uh, being in the woods and getting accidentally shot by a stray bullet. You, you, can, you can, any way possible, any situation you come up with that is death, the reason we die as human beings is because of disobedience to God. But the gift of God, meaning God also gave us a gift, His one and only Son, Jesus Christ, that if you put your faith and your trust in God's Son, you'll have everlasting life. When Jesus come to earth, lived the perfect, sinless, blameless life, uh, did everything right, honored, the God, honored God the Father with His life, taught miracles, everything, you know the story, but people rejected Him and turned Him away, and they beat Him they mocked him and they hung him on a cross to die he hung on that cross willingly at any point in time he could have said hey give me a million angels I don't want to do this but his love was greater than that he hung on the cross willingly bled and suffered and died for me and you Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Put your faith, put your trust in Jesus. And see, the coolest thing about Easter is God being a supernatural, all-powerful, sovereign being supernaturally raised Jesus Christ from the dead three days later. That's my hope, friends. My hope that, it, that is Jesus Christ is exactly who he said he was and who he claims to be. I do believe that Jesus is gonna come back. And when he does come back, you think this coronavirus has got the world in a panic, in a country? You ain't seen nothing yet, friend. When Jesus Christ comes back and, and, and raptures or, or calls up his church, his believers, the people who have put their faith in him, when he calls them back, you don't know what panic is. When millions of people all, all of a sudden are gone, where are all these people at? Say, when you hear me saying God is good, and when you hear me saying trust God and God's favor and all that, see, it's way more than just a few little words. It's my life. It is the life of the believer, of the Christian, that we have that hope in the resurrected Savior. Right? There is only one Jesus Christ, and He is the only one that can fix this world. And when he comes back, he is going to fix it. I assure you of that. So hey, be encouraged today. If you're a believer, be encouraged. That day's coming. Where there's gonna be no more sickness and there's gonna be no more pain and no more suffering. And we're gonna lean on that hope and trust in that hope that God has this, okay? For that person watching that might be on the fence, hey, Put your faith and trust in Christ. He is the only option you have for eternal life. There is no other. Contrary to what other things tell you, there is no other. So, hey, thank you for watching. I appreciate you. Have a great day. Have a great Easter. Uh, get your faith right, and I'll check you later.